Hello and welcome to the latest webinar in the Elemental Talks program for 2022. Our topic today, getting the most out of a heat pump system in our session sponsored by our Technic. Be careful for the next 60 minutes. My name is Jim McClellan, founder and editor Sus Meme, home to both the magazine and the top 500 rankings. Joining me on the panel this afternoon are Laura Bishop, chair of the Ground Source Heat Pump Association, GSHPA, Nathan Gambling, lecturer, consultant, podcast host, and founder at Beta Teach, and Ed Morris, technical manager at Altechnic. It is all live, as you will see. There's a Q&A to finish, so pop your questions, please. There's already a couple in the Ask a Questions box. You'll probably find it at the bottom in the middle of your screen, I think. If you, uh, if you type in there, you pose them, I'll ask them, and they'll answer them. So a little bit about Elemental. So webinar forms part of a program of talks hosted and produced by Elemental, elementalexpo.com. It's the online community for professionals focused on innovations in heat, water, air, and energy, as the name suggests, the vital elements within the built environment now and in the future. Please note, Elemental is a CPD member. So the good news is that means our webinars are CPD accredited. Full diary of events on the website, range of upcoming webinars. You can also view the back catalogue on a whole host of topics, all available on demand. And I've noted a question already asking if this will be available on demand. It will almost the second after we've finished for you to rewatch or share the link. So uh, that might help the uh, member of the audience who's already asked. There's a who's who of great speakers on the stuff on the website. Everything is free to access or hasten to add plus. Crucially, this year, the physical, real-world, in-person Elemental Expo is going to be taking place at the NEC Birmingham, 21 to 23 June next month. So see you all there. Hopefully, right, we've got a lot to get through today, so quick intro from me. Heat pumps. Back in November 2020, the Prime Minister first outlined the UK government's 10-point plan for a green industrial revolution. Aims to create and support up to 250,000 highly skilled jobs as part of a drive towards net zero by 2050. Point number seven in this plan introduced a target, install 600,000 heat pumps every year by 2028. Now, even without that policy impetus, it should come as no surprise heat pumps are growing rapidly in popularity. They not only improve the efficiency of energy systems, they can also, crucially at the minute particularly, reduce bills by up to 26%. So what's not to like? Well, they can prove a costly investment, one that needs to be looked after. As such, careful consideration should be given to selection specification of components in order to optimize, protect each part of the system in the engineering design. This is what we're covering today, effectively. So learning objectives for this session include, by the end of the webinar, we hope to equip you with an understanding of the correct and best components to ensure heat pump efficiency. We'll cover the use of components such as thermal balancing TRBs, dirt and air separation. We'll also instruct how best to protect a heat pump in all types of climate. So, so there are some of the issues we're going to be covering. So let the debate begin. Right. As we start to explore how to get the most out of our heat pump systems, optimize efficiency over time, opportunities, challenges involved as the market grows and develops, I'd like to begin by asking our panel to introduce themselves, obviously, but explain their perspective a bit, share a few opening insights. So briefly, it's a kind of, who are you? Where do you fit into the puzzle? What is the state of play on efficiency and optimization in the UK right now in terms of getting the most out of these heat pump systems? So first, from the ground source up, as it were, perspective, I know, thank you, from a representative body, the GSHPA. Laura, kick us off, please. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah, so I'm Laura Bishop. I am a mechanical engineer. Um, I'm, I'm a system designer. So I run a company that designs large scale um, heat pump systems. And I'm also, as Jim says, the chair of the Grand Source Heat Pump Association. The association represents um, installers and suppliers, designers, consultants, drillers, all working within the Grand Source industry. We are uniquely technical um, in terms of um, the, the people that we work with and the people we support, but we focus very much on lobbying, um, lobbying for heat pump technology to be rolled out. We, we work on standards, we work on training, which I'm going to talk about a bit more about later. Um, 
and we are very much obviously in favour of ground source from myself personally and from the association we firmly believe that ground source heat pumps are the best technology for decarbonising um, heat in the UK of course there's lots of other technologies and many of our members not only do ground source but they do air source and other forms of heating as well so um, we do believe it's the the uh, best solution out there however from what's the state of play on efficiency and optimization in the UK um, I'd say heat pumps work brilliantly they are they can be very efficient um, and they certainly um, in terms of carbon reduction will make the biggest dent in terms of reducing our carbon um the thing that we see time and time again it's extremely important is the way heat pumps are designed installed maintained operated uh, in terms of getting the most out of them so if you get any of those one things wrong or incorrect or slightly wrong then you can really suffer and the and the way that is seen is that you get poor performance and high bills so that's really one of the main things that we see um and that can be caused by all sorts of kinds of different things it can be misunderstanding of the technology it can be um uh, you know not being trained correctly or um people not knowing what they don't know that's one of the main things we see about heat pumps so um those are some of the things that we we see and that those in my um, point from my point of view are the biggest impacts on efficiency and optimization of heat pumps excellent really nice perspective to kick us off so association technical but focused on lobbying standards training as you say heat pumps potential to have the biggest dent made in terms of decarbonisation, so bags of potential, but you've already flagged design, install, maintain, operate. These are all skills and issues where we can optimise and improve potentially. So nice, uh, nice few issues already in place. So Nathan, so I'm coming to you now as an expert in plumbing and heating, and I'm asking you perhaps for your opening overview on sort of current levels of knowledge, learning, training. So how smart is the industry about heat pumps then, Nathan? Well, first of all, that's uh, that would be quite a hard sort of uh, question to really understand. There's a lot of a lot of heating engineers out there, and, and some of them are really good. And probably we wouldn't know about that because it's not that, you know qualifications and accreditations don't mean you're good. So there's there's some good engineers out there, and you know one of the things I'm known for saying I sort of run a podcast is you know the good engineers are the conscientious ones, you know the, the ones that took ownership of their learning. It's not necessarily about what courses they've been on. And there's some really good ones out there, but of course we're in a market traditionally with boilers, and the boiler market got you know, it was a race mm -hmm. to the bottom. So you might have a really good engineer that wants to go into someone's home, sort of thermal image the stuff and, and clean it, system out, and do lots of good stuff. But they're competing with uh, other people that have got very very low prices, and even sort of the affluent sort of members mm -hmm. of a society, have, they don't value our industry that much. That they want to pay as cheap as what they can get. Uh, but that's the good thing as well. So the transition to heat pumps hopefully will change the, the consumer mindset and start to value engineers uh, a little bit better than they do, I think. So that's that's something I try and sort of promote uh, my sort of the sort of the mission of beta teachers to sort of activate heating engineers as learning resources for one another, mm -hmm. so peer learning. Cool. So learning yeah. from, from each other and also activate them as taking ownership of their own learning. Because again, it's not anyone can go on a course in this industry, in most industries actually, you know. And it's not too hard to get assessed and get accredited. But to, to really understand this industry, you've got to take a bit of ownership around your learning. And that's not particularly hard. But like I say, it then comes down to consumers valuing us and paying the engineers what they're mm -hmm. worth, in, 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 in essence. Excellent. Some nice points getting us into the meat of it quickly there. So potential, like many things in heating and plumbing, race to the bottom, you know, cost counting in, in the wrong way. But a uh, nice point about, peer-to-peer -peer learning. Could I just ask you one little follow-up then? What's your sort of quick assessment of the availability and accessibility of training? Is there enough training easily available? If we're going to have all these skilled people fast as fast as humanly possible, just give us a quick, have we got well, anything all, like enough training out there? There's a lot of people talk about training now. And Training has always existed. I mean, there's heat pump courses. Oh, there's, the courses are out there. I mean, everyone thinks apprenticeships are the panacea. That's actually a problem. That's probably perpetuated bad practice. Mm -hmm. So anyone watching this webinar today, today, anyone can <clears> set up as a plumbing company. You haven't got to have any qualifications to set up as a plumbing company because you have to follow the building regs, uh, the water regs. You could then take on a, an apprentice and sign them up for college. 
Now, apprenticeships, basically the primary learning facilitator of an apprentice is the employer. So we can see how that already works. Not the college, they're only there one day a week. So there's a lot of bad practice perpetuated with that system. So that needs to be really looked at. So courses and apprenticeships will only work if we really start to think about, you know, what went wrong in the first place. But it's, it's, it's not it's not that hard for people to want to learn and sort of and, and, main, and get better knowledge around this area. Uh, it's just that they need supported once they do, because if there isn't a market out there that's actually valuing them, mm-hmm. um, that, that's a problem in its own in its own right. Yeah, that's a nice point. And that um, is that uh, that attracts talent. And let's face it, we're in a sector that needs to recruit and recruit a really diverse mix of people. And it needs to retain them as well. Uh, and there's a number of factors involved in that. So this first round then, Ed, if I come to you now for your first opinions on the tech spec side of things. Um, and my current opening question is, is the market comfortable with the fact there is no one size fits all solution? How's it handling the fact it's just not buy it, plug it in, go? Yeah, I think from a perspective like ours, from a manufacturing perspective, we we sort of take, we have a, a three or four pronged attack at this. Obviously, the way the business set up, we have, I know we have a business, so we work with heat pump manufacturers to to integrate our technology into theirs, whether it be brass or whatever it may be. You know, we, we work with the heat pump manufacturers to get their products out the door. Obviously, on the second side of that, as a manufacturer as well, we have products which go to heat pump systems, whether it be the primary side of the system or the secondary side of the system. Um, and you almost, it's it's an, I know Nathan and I have had a chat about this before, and, and Laura will go back to this. It's an ever evolving market at the moment. There's always, there's a hell of a lot of opinion around. You cannot get away from that. There's a lot of p- different people who have got different opinions um, on how things should be done. You know, how do you balance your secondary side of the system? How do you offer your primary side protection? You know, your frost protection, is it glycol? Is it valving? Is it, you know, so it's, it's really difficult to pin anything down. You are right. There is no one size fits all the way because I think we're still learning. I think we're all still learning. And I've got two, two fantastic experts on this call with me who know far more about the heat pump system side of it than what I do. Um, but I think it is ever evolving and, and at quite a fast pace as well, you know, thanks to Boris and, and him throwing down the gauntlet of us, you know, trying to hit these 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 net carbon yeah. zero <laughs> targets. So it's sort of we we sort of sometimes I feel learned on the job, and that's not for the experts because that's what they do day and day. But I think a lot of us, certainly me and, and other people that I talk to, it's a constant learning curve every single day because somebody will come up with a new opinion or a new way of doing things, and it's like, well, we don't know, we've got to go find out does it work. How does it work? It's not been thought of. So, yeah, there is no one size fits all. Difficult as a manufacturer because you're trying to constantly keep up with the yep. change yep. Uh, and, and the next opinion what's coming through and what's the, the next big thing, should we say, on how system works. Yep. So, no, that's that's a nice point, and I think in a sense that's typical of a number of um, fast emerging sectors, not least with green technologies, um, where things are happening at pace. As you say, it's fast paced. It's a rapidly evolving market and there's lots of excitement, dynamism around that, as you rightly say. But it can it can sometimes uh, we sort of think it gets to the phase where it's a bit like a growing up phase. It's like a teenage years. There's loads of potential excitement, but not every bit of the industry is perhaps polished and has got all its skills down. And so you can have that kind of fast growth bit where it can um, be finding its feet as it goes along to some degree. So some nice points to get us going. And I'd like to, in the middle bit now, dig a bit deeper. And obviously the point of us having these webinars is because not everything's perfect and it's not easy. So I want to get into some of the challenges and we're going to lift up a few stones and see what's underneath and talk about the difficult stuff. So zoom in on specifics, challenge the panel. And I want to be talking about why performance does not always match expectation. Of course it can, but what, what happens when it doesn't? When money gets wasted, heat lost, changes in climate and usage can impact efficiency. So I want us to, to identify some of the common problems, also obviously highlight some solutions. And I'd like us to point the finger, if I can ask you to, at whose job it is to A, get it right, and or B, get it fixed. So I want to really get into some of the detail here. So what's the problem? The kit, the spec, the skills, or is it just cost? What needs to happen to help more customers, specifiers, installers, get it right so everyone can get the most out of the heat pump system. So I'm coming to you first, Nathan, and it's more tricky round. So we've heard the numbers. When we try to do the maths around the infamous heat pump target, 600,000 installed, we quickly realize nowhere near the number of skilled people needed to achieve that goal working currently, shall we say. 
The skills are in short supply, productivity falls, but also performance suffers. You already alluded to some of the possibilities there. So I'd like you to identify what are the real problem areas, the hotspots, the critical skill gaps that are going to affect performance of systems and then how do we plug them? So give us your, your worst hotspots for where we've got skill shortages and then how we can plug them and try and fix them, Nathan. Well, I think there's a skill shortage within manufacturers and also uh, the wider industry of people talk about our industry. It's not just the engineers mm -hmm. that mainly. So if you look at manufacturers, and obviously this is why I like working with all technic, you know, Ed's really proactive of pro pro providing some good resources to help people just get the job done. And that's important. You look at other manufacturers and all they're worried about is sales. And then you mm -hmm. look at their PR and marketing behind it. I mean, this is a big industry we're in. We, uh, we're the biggest gas boiler industry in the world until 2016. We've got probably the most overcrowded market, heating industry market in the world. So manufacturers need to start learning. I mean, their technical sales reps need to uh, upskill, if you ask me. It's worth pointing out that heat pumps, anything that moves heat from an evaporator to a condenser via a compressor is a heat pump. All right, it's vapor compression. That means there's loads of them on this planet. So when you go to that Costa machine in your garage, that's a heat pump. When you go to a slush puppy machine, heat pump. Obviously, all your fridges are heat pump. They're in car. There's probably more heat pumps on the planet than people. So they're not new things. <laughs> you know, you sit in a McDonald's. There's loads of them. The, the, the Coke machine, the milkshake machine, the, the, the fridges out the back, the, the VRF uh, comfort cooling systems in the ceiling. It's all heat pump technology. Both the compressor. <clears throat> so it does exist. So this, the, so I, and if you look at the way manufacturers are talking about them it's as if it's new yes hydronic okay. heat pumps you know using them with wet systems is a little bit different than like laura said you know, you've got to get the design right and obviously as we know there's some people that are going to be very good at that they're good at the maths so they're going to get that and then obviously there's some great people that are good with the hands on stuff and repairing stuff and commissioning stuff but yeah i think the whole industry needs to upskill and especially i mean i'm involved in lots and lots of conversations i mean there's there's hundreds of people now thousands of people now talking about this industry some of them are on Absolutely. very good pay grades very yep. good pay grades if you ask them what is a watt, because they're all talking about kilowatts. If you ask them what is a watt, they don't know. You don't know it's a joule per second. And they're on not six six figure salaries, you know, talking about this industry. So they need to upskill as well, because it's, you know, if you want to support this industry, you, you've got to know a little bit as well. So it's not just the engineers. Yeah, and, and engineers, if they really want to change, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll take ownership of their own learning and they'll become passionate and conscientious if there's a market out there that values them. So that's a so, very important thing. If I was going to ask you then to prioritise, if I had to ask you to pick one place in the industry to start the ripple effect, would it be manufacturing? If I had to say, choose where we start then, Nathan. We can't do everything at once. Yeah, where do we start bullshit. to have yeah, okay. To be honest. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because we've had three decades of it, you know. Uh, <laughs> there's some great, great manufacturers out there. Don't get me wrong. And very, very good people working within them. There always has been. Always has been. But there has been a lot of rubbish the last week this transition is going to be a good catalyst to, to make our industry great again and we are going to be the greatest in the world no you know there's got great engineers we could be the greatest in the world and lead the way on this as laura knows and all the associations know you know, europe looks at us for the answers but it's not just the engineers fault it's, it's this wider industry thing we've got to get that right we've got to get that right it's not just about sales okay no no strong shout call out then to manufacturers to uh, cut the greenwash and um and uh, help the industry um talk about the issues it needs to speak about as fast as possible so coming now coming now to you ed so if i'm saying in this tricky middle section so optimizing system efficiency over time it's a balancing act there's products mm -hmm. and tools to help you maintain performance often i think it's the case the heat pump gets the blame when the results don't live up to expectations despite the fact there's other moving parts and default may well lie elsewhere so yeah. i wonder if you could give us a taste on the technical side what are some of the common problem issues faced and whose job is it to take responsibility for getting those things right ed okay it's a good question thank you for asking me um i think i think one of the biggest issues that we have at the moment is that we're always running a comparison to a traditional heating system so a traditional combi board wherever it may be and the way it produces heat and the way we put the secondary system in you know well this is how we do it on a boiler so why can't we do it on a heat pump yeah. what's the difference we're producing heat we're circulating water on a system but the technology is very different the temperatures are very different the way they work um you know a generating heat is very different and we have to think about that but also the environments that we still we're installing into um you know if you were to build a, a house from the ground up 
you could design it around the heat pump, you know, the fabric first and, and the insulation and the way you run your pipes, etc. I think when difficulties come, and, and Rory may agree or disagree, is when we're looking at these retrofit now, when we're trying to fit into homes that are already being built, that may not have the insulation, may not have, you know, the correct pipe in there, we're trying to bolt on these heat pump systems. That's where we get difficulties. And you are right, it is always a heat pump that gets to blame. But, you know, as Laura said, it's all down to design, you know, it's all how how do we design a system to mount the heat pump, the heat pump, give it its best chance to work. We see it in, in heat networks on, on when, you know, we're working district heating. <clears throat> district heating falls over, but the thing that gets a blame is the HIU that's hanging on the wall, but you're not giving it the source, the, the, the fuel it needs to work properly. Heat pumps are no different. They're just working very different ways. We're, we're not very good at adapting change. In the UK, we'll have the heating on and we'll have the window open. It's just the way we are. It's the way we're yeah, geared, yeah. geared up to work hard. I'm a bit hot. I won't turn the boiler down. I won't turn it in. I'll open the window for a bit. And that's just the way we do it. And, and heat pumps have to change the way we think about that because the way they heat, they heat at a, you know, a lower temperature, a, a constant rate. Whereas before, we used to walk into a room, so I'm a bit cold. I'll put the heating on. I'll yeah, turn it to yeah. five. You know, it's different mentalities. It's different. I think it's managing expectation is one of the biggest difficulties that we've got. Is, is how it's going to perform and, and what is the expectation of its output. Um, well, that's, not, that's part. And could I ask you to, you talk about challenge of retrofit, managing expectations. Could I ask you to pick a few components perhaps where, you know, which could be good or bad or could be typically yeah. part, part of the problem, part of the solution. What components would you name check as? Uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's very different ways. I mean, if you look at it from a problem side, you're looking at system protection. So, you know, you want a heat pump to work as efficient as you can. So, you know, there's a big argument whether you use glycol. Do you not use glycol to keep it as a freshwater system and use something like an antifreeze valve? Dirt and air separation. You know, we want these systems to be clean. We want the, the heat pump to have, uh, you know, a good lifespan. So we've got to make sure that we're treating the air and the dirt that's in the system and, and getting it out. But from a sex side, Nathan and, and Laura, I know this is a debate. It's how we control the heat within the home. You know, traditionally, we'd use a TRV. We'd use... You know, a thermostatic controlled right a valve on a radiator would open and close it up, depending on what the room was, depending on the load. Do heat pumps do the same? You know, there's a massive argument now for direct piping heat pumps without any kind of thermostatic control. And you just so you're not having these these temperature bridges or these air gaps between rooms, you're just circulating everything that you're using. Do you use thermal stores? Do you not use thermal stores? It's an it's an ever evolving market. I'll go back to what I said before. Tomorrow someone will have a new opinion on how things are done. And then us as, a, as an industry, and that would be Laura, that would be Nathan, that would be me and anybody else, we have to adapt that because it may very well be a very good insight, a very good, you know, comment that's been made. And we have to look at that. We can, we as, as manufacturers can spend millions of pounds on research, but there's always somebody out there that will come up with something that you don't think of. Yep. So, you know, frost protection, dirt and air separation, and then control of, the, of how it works within the property will be the key ones for me. Excellent. Nice pointers there. And um, I'm going to come to Laura now. Could I... We've got a really good number, over 100 people on the uh, session at the moment. We're going to get quite a lot of questions at the bottom. We can also see quite a lot of activity in the chat. So if I could ask, when I'm asking one of the other panellists, maybe, uh, for instance, I'm about to ask Laura, maybe Ed and Nathan, if you see something in the chat, not the questions, please, but in the chat panel that you'd like to add a little something to, that'll help us maybe pick up some of the uh, the comments and the issues there because we're going to struggle to do everything at the end so um so while i'm speaking to laura i'm sure you'll be listening but if you could also do a little bit of uh, multitasking and maybe add the odd comment in the chat if you can see something on which you can um offer a little extra so laura coming to you then we're in this tricky section last in this round so heat pump booming prospect woohoo but the last thing the industry needs we know this kind of is reputations perceptions to get tarnished because of quality issues, cost concerns, it might might be fake news. It might might, but you don't want heat pumps to be seen as difficult or expensive or just even overhyped. So, what are the main pain points that you anticipate could be difficult for the sector, and what can the association do to keep market confidence up and high, resilient? Yeah. OK, well, there's a couple of things I just wanted to come back on. Um, Nathan said right at the start about engineers and, and, and um, you know, plumbers taking uh, taking ownership of their training. So it's not or, or knowledge. And I think that's a massive part of this. It's not just about going on a training course for two yeah. days, three days. It's actually 
learning and taking uh taking real interest in learning about what you're doing so even now i've i've only been working in the industry 11 years there's a lot of people who've been working in this a lot longer although i've been an engineer for over 20 years every day for me is a learning day every single day there's something new you know um ed said it as well there um and it's about keeping on top of those things and not everybody does that if i can Mm -hmm. say that um, so, um, you know, you've got to have people out there who are willing to understand. The other thing I just wanted to say is that if you're moving, we've got a gas industry at the moment. And my background is in, in big industrial plant rooms. But I go into gas fire plant rooms now that are really poor, really bad. They've got um, very bad design, very bad installation. And yet because gas boilers are generally oversized and because gas is cheap, if it doesn't work properly, nobody knows because the gas bills mm-hmm. are higher than they should be, but nobody knows because gas is cheap. But also yeah. the fact that the gas, that they're still heating, there's still hot water. If you apply the same philosophy, whatever philosophy they're using to design with, to a heat pump, it will go absolutely wrong. You will have no heat, no hot water and high bills. Those That's, that's ultimately what will happen. Right. So we need this step change from um, where we're designing or putting in plant rooms or even like domestic plumbing systems to where we need to be with heat pumps. My background, as I said, sorry to go back, but my background is in mechanical engineering and we designed everything. So if you're designing a nuclear submarine, for example, you design it, you don't just rock up on site and start putting bits together. (laughs) Sometimes I do see that with with these systems going in and I've heard other installers say to me, oh, we're just muddling through on big, big, um, big museums and things doing heating and cooling with heat pumps and they're just muddling through and I'm thinking what are you doing um this isn't going to work so I think you know it's going to come back to the training and skills um up, upgrading and and people you know like like Nathan says and that's something that comes within from within I think rather than you know being, okay. being something that you can just learn um so the other thing that the GSHPA has been doing is working on standards so we've recently launched a drilling standard yeah. with um the drilling um action um the British Drilling Association, sorry. But one of the things we've found even with our standards within our own industry, we need to standardise, we need to regulate to make mm-hmm. things sure things are done properly so that if a homeowner has a, a problem with drilling or, or a heat pump installation, they've got something to fall back on. But even with our own industry, there are people who are against standards, mm-hmm. who have not helped and have said, actually, we're, we're telling them that they don't know what they're doing or you know they haven't been able to get involved when actually we've invited everybody in to develop this standard and that's another thing that's a problem in the industry I don't know how you get over that because not standardizing the things that we do is is a difficult thing um but we need to continue and we will continue as an industry to to standardize different different aspects of what we do and the big one for me um I'll talk about cost at the end, but the, the other big one for me is myth busting and newspaper headlines. Yeah, yeah. So the Daily Mail, um, the the Guardian, um, there's probably lots of <laughs> convention, all of them actually, that have these big massive headlines, front page, heat pumps don't work, why yeah, yeah. Have reasons not to have a heat pump, that was one recent one. And the problem is that the, the normal person in the street is opening the newspaper and reading these headlines and immediately going, right, I'm not having a heat pump. I'm not having a heat pump. They don't work. And actually, they've been written by journalists. I don't know whether they have another agenda or whether they just genuinely don't understand, but they won't engage with us as the industry, even though I've messaged some of the people afterwards and said, please come and talk to us because you're factually wrong. Yeah, in what yeah, you're yeah. Um, but every time we have a bad install, that's a bad news story that the media will pick up on. Every time we have 10 good news stories, doesn't really, it's like, you know, bad news is makes news, doesn't it? Good news doesn't. So those are the main pain points. And the only way we can get around it is to have good people designing, installing, maintaining correctly, giving the proper and good advice, even if it's don't bother having a heat pump because it yeah. won't work for you, being honest. Yep. Yeah. 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 Um, and then, you know, tackling these... Um, Whenever we have good stories, we need to be putting them out there and saying this is how heat pumps can work in old buildings, this is how heat pumps can work in colleges, in an old house, anything like yeah. that. Yeah, really good points there. And I mean, I know because I am a member of the Filthy Press. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we have a lot to answer for. In a sense, in especially in the green technologies, you can speak to the people in solar and wind. They experience that kind of um, uh, backlash in the press and it doesn't work solar panels don't work wind doesn't work you know at various points we'll have electric vehicles don't work the 
one after another, there will be these backlash stories which are often unfounded or generalizing from one bad experience or one bad, poor example of application engineer, etc. In a sense, I think there's a challenge and the association probably has a role here, as do some of the manufacturers, to get collectively get better at a little bit of mini crisis management, I think, in dealing with these things and myth busting and getting the good messages out uh, effectively and as widely as possible as fast as possible because the longer these these bits of misinformation remain in the public domain they become sort of facts you know and people google and they've got the top five things etc so it is it is part of this mainstreaming anything that mainstreams you know uh, experiences a bit of this but maybe heat pumps are going to have their moment of um, you know, critical fire in that sense. So, um, right now, so we are, we are we are moving through nice and quickly. We've got a bunch of questions. We've got thanks for doing great work on the chat there as well. Much appreciated. I know it keeps you busy, but um, uh, so last round of questions from me. Quite quick, this last bit, and then we'll get to the audience. So we've looked at all the difficult stuff and all the challenges and why it might not work and what the problems might be. This last bit, I'd just like us to look at some of the real positives because, of course, the reason there's this potential boom and it's year of the heat pump and the, there are already more heat pumps than people, apparently, according to Nathan, there's going to be even more. So, but the, the reason it's so exciting is because the potential is fabulous. So, let, you know, for the final round, I'd like us to talk about some of the real positives and opportunities before we go to the questions. So, successful and sustainable approaches. We can get heat pump systems that meet or exceed the expectations. They can help the UK decarbonize heat, save money on energy bills, create green jobs, get us nearer to those net zero targets. All of that. Tick, 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 tick. Fabulous potential. So first up, Ed. So as a solutions provider, I'm going to ask you really with your business hat on. Paint us a picture of the market opportunity. What, what can you hope to do in this space as this market really explodes for us? <clears throat> okay. I mean, I think the market opportunity is huge and, and that sits for everybody around this table, really. Technology is constantly evolving, you know, borders have, borders have evolved over the years and, and heat pumps, you know, they're, they're it's like Nathan said, they've been around for years and years and years, maybe in different forms, yep. but heat pumps have always been around. And, you know, the, 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 the size for us now is huge because we, say we, we have a different kind of tactic. We can work directly with heat pump manufacturers, so we can put some of our technologies within their technologies. And, but just the way, you know, the likes of people like Laura who, who are really into the system design of things. Us as manufacturers have got the, the capacity and the capability to be able to produce various components, whether it be valving, whether it be protection, whatever it be, to, to enable this, this, the, the engineering side of it to be delivered. You know, because at the moment you can say, okay, we need to get X weight of flow right with whatever it might be. But how do we achieve that? You know, can we as manufacturers work with engineers and stuff to develop products to do that? So that, that's where... The exciting part of this comes, it is, although it's not a new industry, it's it's an upcoming industry with the way it's evolving so quickly. Yep. So I think for us, it's exciting. We're, we're still learning. You know, traditionally, we are we are a gas boiler. You know, that's how we support. We've always sat in a domestic world yep. of, of gas boilers. It's just another way of heating water. And we, we just need to all get a greater understanding of how we use that energy. Because, um, you know, we, we you can have a really poorly designed, uh, you know, combi boiler system. But because you're just reducing excessive amounts of heat, you never really notice because you're still yeah. going to get your and you're still going to get your hot water. You know what we're looking at now is is not necessarily producing so much hot water, but you know the way we control it, and we want to be at the forefront of that work with the likes of Laura and Nathan and other people in this industry to be able to produce that technology. So the opportunity for us as manufacturers is, is huge. Excellent, nice points there, and I think we're well, perhaps we won't go into this, but we're interesting situation right now especially because often when we've had this kind of debate previously one of the issues we talked about is the fact that whether it be water or heat energy it's just been too cheap for people to pay attention because the difference in their bills in many cases has been negligible and you know except obviously now there's enormous focus on energy bills and the cost of energy to nathan's earlier point about whether that focus on cost turns into an understanding of value that's a big a big question for the industry but we're in a slightly different market now than we were even a few months ago so i think um there, there are fresh challenges as you say ed it's evolving and that is adding a different level of expectation and some new questions for the industry to respond to so laura and this positives then so we understand fuel poverty is looming large for some people we should say that but give us 
give us your elevator pitch, please. Put a put on your sales hat and give us the business case for investing in heat pumps. Yeah. So give us give us that sell, Laura. Okay. So uh, I don't think heat pumps are going to be going anywhere. Um, the government have put their hat in the ring and said the future of decarbonisation of heat is heat pumps. There will be others, as I've said, mm -hmm. and. Um, so um, we are generally looking at heat pumps. And I just have to say this. I bought uh, one of my magazines just lately and there was a mention of heat pumps three times in there. And this is like just a normal ladies <laughs> magazine. So it's getting into the mainstream. Uh, people know what they are. Um, so in terms of the business case, I think it was either last week or the week before Imperial College London launched a report that said for the first time in the UK, heat pumps are financially, you're going to, sorry, mm -hmm. you're going to have lower bills using a, a heat pump than with other fuels so that report is now out there it's in, independent and from the academic sector running my own quick calcs this morning um if you were to take um uh, electricity bills i mean they're all over the place aren't they at the moment but if you took gas at say eight pence a kilowatt hour and electricity at 30 pence a kilowatt hour and you said you had a building that needed an x amount of kilowatt hours and you used a gas boiler and then you used an air source heat pump at a certain efficiency you would be looking at slightly higher um, electricity bills for your air source. But if you started then to increase your performance or your COP, which is where it becomes extremely mm -hmm. important to make sure it's efficient, you can really start to see your bills, your annual bills reduce. So if you had a ground source heat pump working at a scope of three and a half, uh, 350% efficiency versus a gas boiler at 93% efficient, over the course of a year, your bills would be lower at 30 pence a kilowatt hour. If you then factor in things like solar PV on your roof, so you can mm -hmm. offset your electricity being brought in, you can reduce that even further. If you've got battery storage, and then if you've got commercial systems, thermal storage, absolutely critical for doing things like demand side response, um, separating heat demand from heat generation so that you can take advantage of cheap electricity. You just can't do that with gas. Gas is what it is. With a heat pump, you can do all of these plain tunes with the way that the heat pump generates heat and how it consumes electricity and when. Uh, and that's the way that we're going to see um, the cost, the running cost of heat pumps comes down. One last thing on that is the um, GSHPA and others in our industry are lobbying the government hard on removing the environmental levies that have been historically mm. put onto the electricity price, which means that electricity is expensive and starting to move that onto gas. Now, obviously, that could cause problems with fuel poverty mm. even more, which we don't yep, want. Yep, yep. But we need what we really like to see is a heat pump electricity tariff. So if you've got a heat pump, you pay a lower price and that's a big winner for people who want to move over to uh, heat pumps great some interesting ideas and a real sense of um why why you should i mean it might be unavoidable but there are clear benefits and there are already uh studies coming out that are suggesting they can demonstrate the uh, the savings as well so nathan then last one and then we're going to get to these questions we've got queuing up so i'm asking you put your rose tinted spectacles on Glad, I know engineers don't like glass half full, but glass half full. Give us your most wildly optimistic, Nathan. Fast forward five or ten years or even less. What might success look like for the heat pump industry? Go on, paint us a, a really rosy picture of how, how things could go brilliantly for us, Nathan. Well, good, good engineers getting paid what they're worth and manufacturers <laughs> doing what they do. <laughs> supposed to be doing, uh, simply. Uh, I, I want to pick up on the point. There's some someone just said about the, the highly skilled uh, engineers. Yeah, we have got some highly skilled engineers. I really feel sorry for consumers because they don't know who they are. So the consumers are in a sort of a weird position where they don't know who the good engineers are. Same as local authorities. I mean, I speak to a few local authorities because they're managing these, mm -hmm. they're managing public funds, millions and millions of pounds. They've got <laughs> suppliers that are able to do this stuff. So they need to know who the good suppliers are, the good engineers. So there's, I feel sorry for consumers. There isn't sort of really anything out there that can tell them. Uh, someone mentioned about the media. So we had a heat pump system built in 1948 in my home city. John Sumner built it, uh, heated up. I think it worked into the 2000s, heating up all the factory workers at the Gerald's printing press. No one ever talked about it. What they did talk about was the one that was built in 1951 or 52 at the London Festival House because the designers didn't take into account how insulated the festival house is. It's got lots of soundproofing. So the heat pump was oversized. It was before inverter technology. So we had capacitors, large capacitors, turning it on and off, loads of noise. It got taken out and the press were all over it. And that was back in 1951, mm -hmm. 52. So the press loved bad stories. And to answer uh, Laura's question, I mean, I know some of the environmental uh, editors, they contact me, rally, 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 and you have to be a little bit careful because I don't want to be quoted wrongly. But 
if you look at newspapers now, they are online and they have comments. So they're their own little social media platforms. The more comments you get, the better revenue they get. So if you put controversial stories out there, you get more interaction. So they're not actually that worried about factual stuff. They just want lots and lots of interaction on their comments because that's how they get their revenue now. From it. And so the more controversial these things are, and that's a problem because the wrong the wrong information is getting out. So that's a problem. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then the old building someone's just commented on, you know, heat pump trials are going on back in the 1950s, Lord Nuffield, Lucas Electrics, you know, they all work. Yeah, good. So, I mean, flagging clickbait again, which is going to be an issue. I would also say a really quick point on the media side of things. We need images. The media runs stories with images, which is why they used uh, a wind turbine or a solar panel, because they're the eye candy of renewables. Everybody knows what they look like. And the, the consumer has a mental picture that that green energy is just panels and turbines. You know, I would challenge the heat pump sector get some visuals well that's a get, get people an idea of um you know get it in their head as a positive picture it's a good point where they could go it's a good point but there is a problem everyone thinks heating is the is the heat pump the efficient heat pump or the efficient boiler heating isn't a, a, a pro it's a system someone's mentioned in there about the home and insulation so it's a it's an even bigger system it's your home heating is a system and we'll use a good analogy so most people won't know but ed got signed up as a professional footballer when he was younger so did my little brother Hereford United. I don't know if they still do it, but back in that day, they used to do all their fitness training at the SAS camp. Now, my brother is super fit. At 46, he's still got a resting heartbeat at 39. If you put that efficient heart in my body, I'm not going to be able to run any faster or for any long, longer because I'm fat. Right? My system, doesn't matter how efficient that heart is, and it's exactly the same with heating. It doesn't matter how efficient these boilers are or heat pumps. It's a system. So it's all it's the radio, it's the emitters, very, very important, getting the size of your emitters right and, and understanding uh, power but, uh, and, and well, you see, you, you've given you've given us a nice because that that visual metaphor there, you see, telling that story, people get that. The idea of a heart transplant well, it, doesn't work in the wrong body. But let's jump yeah. to some questions then, because they are really queuing up and I'm conscious of the time. So if I remind people. This is all recorded. You will be able to view it afterwards. But for the moment, live, you have about 20 minutes. Get your questions in the ask a question box at the bottom. We'll try and get to as many as possible, please. Stick them in there and we'll come to them. So the first couple I'd like to take are about performance over time. So there's one from uh, Samantha Mant. She's saying efficiency installation, critically important. What happens long term? Um, realities of performance day to day over a period of time. Lime scale. The second question um, has come in, uh, no name actually, oh, via LinkedIn, what are the lifespans for the different types of heat pumps? So I wonder if we could take those two longevity and duration questions. So Ed, would you mind kicking us off a bit with the question about performance over time, lime scale, lifespan, you know, how long did they last and how easy are they to keep? Okay. I mean, I think, I think Laura might be better the position to answer that one. But I mean, from, from our perspective, it's, it's it's no different to anything else, no different to your car, no different to your current boiler. It's all about maintaining. It's all about making sure that you're giving it the best chance of a good life. So that the water that you're putting through, the condition of the water, you know, servicing, all that kind of stuff is, is vitally important. Now, if you're if you're not looking after it, the way it should be, if it's work outside, it's pranks or whatever it be, it's going to shorten the lifespan. And that's how I think Laura's maybe better have more experience on the lifespan of, of what heat pumps are. But I think, you know, it's all about maintenance and, and, and making sure you've got clean systems, et cetera. Yeah, excellent. Maintenance, as a neighbor used to say to me all the time because I was neglectful, it's the M word, Jim, maintenance. Yeah, and I used to ignore him every time. But Laura, so the longevity question, the um, the lifespan, the lime scale, all those things, yeah. um, how, how do you keep it sweet over time, Laura? So Absolutely agree with Ed. Um, I think there are some people who have been told by their installer it's fit and forget. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely not true. Uh, so making sure, for example, like Ed said, you know, your chemical treatment, your water treatment's correct in the first place, or, you know, you've got a nice clean system to start with. If you have an air source heat pump, obviously they're sitting outside. I noticed one question early on about uh, coastal areas. Um, you, you know, you, you need to just make sure that you're picking the right heat pump for a salty area because corrosion will be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, ground source heat pumps sit inside your building, so therefore they will last longer because they are inside. They're therefore not being affected by the elements as long as you're still treating them nicely, um, treating them well and maintaining them. Air source heat pumps. Um, I, I mean, I've seen heat pumps 
you know, air conditioning units, Nathan said about those earlier on. I've seen them that are, you know, 25, 30 years old. They're rusty as heck, but they're still working. So, um, you know, you could be looking at, you know, 15, 20 years for, for an air source, but you might want to think about replacing it earlier than that. Gas boiler, for example, you should be looking at around 10, 10 years to replace. So maybe 10, 15 years to make sure that they are uh, still working efficiently. Um, but as I say, ground source, the unit itself, they're indoors, so they do tend to last longer. In terms of the infrastructure, what goes in the ground, the ground collector, that's 100 years. That will sit there, in fact, probably longer than that. You know, there's probably systems that have been, no, I wouldn't say 100 years ago, we weren't doing it. But there will be systems that are still here when we're all dead that will still be fine. Okay, good point. <laughs> yeah. Nathan, if I could um, ask you what you've, you have touched on this, but if we could just come back to it again, it is from Ken Gordon. He's saying, Nathan said the UK has a highly skilled workforce for heating, which you did mention, but these are people we need to transition and what transferable skills, I think, is what we're wanting to talk about in a sense in this. So, Nathan, how do we get people who are skilled engineers or are skilled in heating and uh, plumbing, how do we get more people with transferable skills transitioning into this kind of heat pump market? Well, well, it usually comes with a sort of an awareness, doesn't it? And obviously there is that happening. People are talking about it. Uh, people are talking about it on the media. I think if, it, I think if consumers are armed with some very good information, not, not too technical because there is, you know, heating is technical. If they're armed with some very good information of how to judge a good engineer, that helps because then the, then the ones, the engineers that aren't perhaps that, that, that good uh, unconscious incompetent or consciously incompetent, as we call it, uh, they can do something about it. <laughs> Um, you know, that is a big problem. There are people out there in consci unconsciously incompetent. You know, they're, they're, they're passionate people, but they don't really know that they don't know. And they, that you can do something with them. You've mm -hmm. got then conscious yeah, incompetent yeah. people. Some of them are nice. You know, they're a bit nervous that they don't know stuff. Yeah, yeah. Some are horrible. They know they don't know it, and they're out there exploiting people day in, day out, and they're not bothered. So there's a there's a whole... Di you know, it's a very yeah. heterogeneous nice mix that are in street, as, as are consumers. But if consumers have got a little bit of information, there's no good information out there at the moment uh, for them, bless them. Uh, but if they've got a bit of good information, that kind of snowballs effect, because if they start asking the right questions to an engineer mm -hmm. and that engineer thinks, oh, I don't really know that. I'm going to go and find that out. So you know, but, and there are some very clever consumers out there that will know that, you know, you, if your home needs eight kilowatts at minus three, it's only going to need seven kilowatts when it's zero or three point six kilowatts when it's 10 degrees. That kind of might make a, an engineer feel nervous. Oh, I better know that. I better know about the yeah, movement yeah. of heat. Let's, let's learn that. And bang, they've done. And, and it's and it's so we get this thing where the good ones. And, and we get rid of that cap. The cowboy element is very small, but it does have a big effect yep. on our industry. That, nice point about a need for support as well. And I know I'm working the panel hard, but if you could keep each when you have a moment having a look in the chat because there's some nice bits of comments and questions and you might be able to throw something in there. It might not be an answer as such. It might just be an, an additional point to make. Ed, we've got a couple in the questions here. I was seeing your name coming up. So uh, one they were saying, uh, Andy says, Comment from Ed, heat pumps don't heat as fast as a boiler. This is often a sizing issue. If calculate loads over 10 kilowatts and a 6 kilowatt heat pump is installed, there'll be an issue. So don't heat as fast. Is it a sizing issue? And the one underneath that, Ed, if you can see it from Alicia as well, impacted by flow rates of a system for situations where there's a higher flow rate needed, what would you recommend is the best method? So I wonder if you could just say a little something there, Ed, on sizing and flow rates maybe to um, start picking up those two if you could i think we've always had an issue in size no matter whether it be heat pumps or whether it be gas boilers or, or district heating we've always we, we have this tendency to want to produce as much heat as we can we get all the heat out and then we'll just work out what we do with it you know we'll, we'll put it through the rads we'll use it to mess it hot water whatever it might be so i think the size of it's key we always work on what called fabric first work out what you need what is your load what are you actually going to need at any one point for this system to work and then you design everything around that so traditionally we've always done right this is our heat source this is how we're going to produce our heat we will then build a building we'll make it work whereas no let's let's work out what we do need let's work out yeah. what is the volume of the water in the rats how much water we need to soak out and what is the heat load we need to produce and then we'll fit the right heat pump or the right heat source to that system to get what we need because we just waste so much energy at the moment it's unbelievable because we just overproduce heat and you know we store it then you get thermal losses and whatever it may be so you know it's, it's calculating and understanding what you actually need to start with to then put the right heat pump and the right system in place laura do you agree you're the expert in this not me yeah laura would you like to come in on the uh, sizing and uh 
sizing yeah. and flow rates. Yes. Starting point, exactly as Ed says, you must understand what your heat demand is. What's your peak heat demand? What's your annual demand? Um, do you want to have some kind of bivalent system in so that you don't actually oversize your heat pump? Um, as I said earlier on about gas boilers, most gas boilers are oversized, but it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter. But in terms of people's comfort, it doesn't matter because it still does the job with a heat pump that won't work. Um, so, yeah, you need to understand the, the, the heat demand of the building before you get anywhere near picking a heat pump. Um, in terms of flow rates, that shouldn't be an issue. So flow rate is a function of delta T and kilowatt output. So as long as you've got both of those correct, you will be able to get the flow rate you need as long as you pick the correct heat pump. So, you know, we've got systems that are 10 megawatts. They're ginormous heat pumps doing cities. Flow rate is not an issue there you just need to make sure you've picked the right heat pump for the job excellent and laura could while i've got you there sort of jump this quick one linkedin question somebody's thrown in here is planning permission required for a heat pump um so on the commercial side probably because you might be looking at energy centers and huge ground collectors on the domestic side i don't know what it is anymore on rhi yes but i don't know um nathan or ed do you know better about planning now not on the RHI. Right um, I'm not sure. I'd have to. We'd have to have it. I wouldn't want to give the wrong answer if you know what I mean. So, I well, think for that's... domestic air source, it was always lawful development that you needed. Yeah, yeah. I don't know whether you need planning. There's permitted development, and then some situations you might need planning. I just wanted to pick up on the sizing thing. So the sizing thing is really interesting, and uh, I'm going to use another analogy. So there's some really good calculation software out there. So sort of I recommend Heat Engineer and, and, and Sonic from Midsummer Energy. But I'm going to use another. If, if you're getting married and, and you want your wedding dress or your suit, uh, you don't calculate the size. Uh, you measure it. So, like, you know, you, you don't ring up the dressmaker and they ask, you know, how much do you weigh? What's your body mass index? And how high are you? Up? <laughs> what's, what's your exercise? What, what do you eat every day? And then they calculate it. What they do, they measure you. There is things in place in this country where we can actually measure actual real heat loss in real time. It gives you something called the HTC, heat and transfer coefficient. And anyone that's interested in that, they can look up the Bayes meter trials. So that gives you what you need to know right from the word go. It gives you what you need to heat your home up at design conditions, which is sort of the average coldest day. And then once you've got that, you can then start to design. And, and obviously, Laura is involved in ground source, a bit more design work involved in that because you've got to think about your collector size as well as your emitter size. But you need that proper figure right from the word go. And then also, uh, we talk about the skills. We've got situations where we can monitor heat systems. We can monitor their mm -hmm. performance. So people talk about COP, they talk about SCOP, and they talk about system performance um, fact, factors and stuff like that. Now, we've been monitoring heat pump systems for some time. Ofgem has got quite a lot of data. Unfortunately, we don't have access to it. Uh, some people do, but it's not all of us. We could be learning from that data. So I, I will be working with some, some teams actually for the Heat Pump Ready program, I think, where we can use that information to help engineers get better. You know, they can look at it and think, oh, why is not that performing so good as what we thought it would? And they can, they, one of the things I promote is a hive mindset. You know, us engineers can't know everything, but as a hive yeah. mindset, we can really work on the challenges. And monitoring systems will help us. And because we've got the technology, I mean, we're all walking around with supercomputers in our pockets. We've got the technology to monitor stuff. And that's going to be a big, important thing in the future, I think, monitoring stuff so we can learn from it. Excellent. And there's a couple of questions here because we're getting down to the last few minutes now. If I sort of paraphrase them, there's one from Peter Bessie and one from Peter McBride. And they're both, if you like, partly talking about radiators. So from Peter Bessie talks about uh, uh, use of high temperature heat pumps uh, suitable with standard radiators etc and uh, the one from peter mcbride i think the panel can see this as well current energy crisis decarbonize space heating make it affordable with good design this is achievable with correct size emitters and radio i wonder if the panel first uh, laura and then ed could just say a little bit about radiators in connection with heat pumps give us a couple of thoughts around that topic which some of these questions are clearly uh, picking up yeah um so uh there's a there is, in my opinion, a big myth around the fact that if you're going to have a heat pump, especially in an existing building, that you have to rip out all your radiators. That's not always the case, but and it should not be the starting point. This is where you look at a building as a whole, holistically, what's it got already? Can it cope with a lower flow temperature? Um, if you've got a new build, obviously that's different. You know, 
you can buy radiators now we've we just had all our radiators redone for low flow temperatures we haven't got underfloor heating i i couldn't have it in this house um underfloor heating is great but you can still use radiators with a heat pump as long as they're correctly sized you can also use convector radiators to blow the air around as well to help warm up the room um in terms of high temperature heat pumps, yes, they are becoming more prevalent, especially with the transition away from um, uh, high global warming potential refrigerants. So if you're using a propane heat pump, for example, they tend to be capable of higher temperatures. They've just got to watch the cop. Um, probably over the long term of the project, it might be better to switch out a few radiators, um, particularly small ones. What we are finding as an industry, although we don't have the data, unfortunately, but I keep trying to get it, is that lots we have anecdotal installers going in saying, we never we never replaced the radiator, we never replaced their handler unit, the heat pump went in, the client was happy to check how it went and actually we've not had a problem at all. So that's the anecdotal information, not just from one project, but from many projects. But what we're lacking is the data behind that. But I would say from a starting point, uh, try to use a standard temperature heat pump if you can, because the COP is more likely to be higher. Replace odd radiators if you need to, but you can certainly use radiators with standard heat pumps. But heat, high temperature ones are good too. Ed, any quick comment on heat pumps I and radiators? Yeah, I think, look, if you're going to use existing, you've got to give the heat pump the best chance of operating. And when I say that, I'm looking from a system side where the system performance if you've got an old radiator that's clogged up with magnetite, whatever it may be, and you're trying to use a heat pump to work it, it's not going to work. You know, if you're going to look at inspect the condition of it, flush it through, use the floor wash, whatever it may be, you know, you've got to give these systems the best chance of working because we're so critical of a heat pump when we're not really looking at what, what the problem could be. And that could be, you know, if you've not got enough flow through, it's not going to get hot enough. So, you know, if you are going to use it, then yeah, absolutely. But again, work out what your heat load is, work out what you need. Can the building cope with it? Is it going to give you what you need at that point? Excellent. And then the last minute, one more for you, Ed, there. I've got one very quick one from Ian Bowman. He simply asks about air source heat pumps installed in the UK. Are they designed and manufactured to work efficiently in the UK? Quick question there. Is that for me? Yes. Do you want to? Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Look, they're designed to work. I'm guessing, I mean, Laura, I don't know whether there are any specific criteria for the UK market. Obviously, we, we do have lower temperatures at times when we need to produce more heat. Um, but you know, heat pumps are designed to work with that, and, and I'm guessing that they are flat, um, you know, flat design across across all the Nordic states. They get colder than what we do, um, mm. but they are very efficient systems. So, you know, we, I think we just need to change our mentality around perception of what we're going to get, what we need, um, you know, and what the output is, and then I think we'll all start to understand it a bit better. Excellent, really good point to end on, and there is a lot um, uh, in terms of managing expectations adapting, shifting mentalities. It is an evolving scenario, as you had almost, said, Ed, almost at the top of the show. This is this is a moving game we're in here at the moment. And if we did this again next month and the month after, we'd be talking about slightly different issues and the noise in the press would have moved on again. So excite, exciting area to be in. We've covered all the questions. There is one left in the Ask a Quick. If I could ask the panel as I wrap up, if you click, if I click the green button for start answering, there's one extra from Peter McBride. If you've got a chance to type a comment, if you click comment, I think you can write one if you look in the answer to the question. So you okay. should see one question less. There's a, if you could do, if you have any chance to type to his question while I do the wrap up, we'll have done a full house. We'll have covered everything, which is brilliant work from you panel. So thank you then. Big thank you to all our panelists, Laura, Nathan, of course, Ed, and our sponsors, the lovely people at Altechnic. Also to yourselves out there, virtual audience on Crowdcast, bags of comments, loads of questions, great work, thank you very much. Reminder to check out Elemental, elementalexpo.com. Of course, come and see us at the NEC next month if you're in the UK. Elemental, online community for professionals focused on innovation, heat, water, air and energy, vital elements within the built environment now and in the future. Full diary of events on the website. You'll also be able to find this, several people have asked, it'll be on demand, the beauty of Crowdcast is literally a minute i think after we press end here you'll be able to access it you can re-watch it you can go back if you miss the start you can send the link to somebody else it's all free to access all the comments i believe will be in there as well so you should be able to use the resource in its fullest sense immediately after we're done so it's a it's, it's a useful tool straight away so thank you once again then laura nathan and ed that's it for today. I've been Jim McClellan, editor at Susmeme. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you 
all again soon. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.